gas stream is first produced, it often consists of a number of different hydrocarbon gases. Depending on what they are, these gases can be classified as light or heavy. The percentage of each gas and the availability of markets for these products determines whether the hydrocarbon products should be separated. Efficient separation of the components can be accomplished by a number of different methods, including the method we'll be looking at in this module, chilling the gas stream to very cold temperatures. Chilling transforms some of the gases into liquids, which can then be separated from the lighter gas. In this program, you will see some of the reasons for separating natural gas liquids, also called NGLs, from a gas stream. We'll look at common methods for chilling gas to separate the liquids. And we'll see how the application of very low temperatures to a gas stream, commonly called cryogenics, affect liquid separation. Prior to viewing this program, you should have successfully completed the modules titled Basic Principles of Pressure and Temperature, Centrifugal Compressor Principles, and Heat Exchanger Principles. Now, if you haven't, you may want to study these programs before proceeding. One other thing before we continue. Cryogenics deals with a wide range of temperatures, and especially extremely cold temperatures. Keep this in mind when you're working around a cryogenic plant. Your safety is very important during all operations. This is the first section of a three-section module on cryogenic principles. In the first section, we'll look at natural gas components, economics of liquid separation, gas chilling, the definition of cryogenics, and the cryogenic process. Natural gas streams include different types of hydrocarbon gases. Now, the exact percentage of each hydrocarbon gas in a natural gas stream varies based on production region, and on temperature and pressure of the gas stream. Hydrocarbon gases are generally described as either light or heavy. Hydrocarbon molecules are composed of hydrogen and carbon. This weight description, light or heavy, commonly refers to the number of carbon atoms in each gas molecule. Light gases have a small number of carbon atoms, while heavier gases have more. The remainder of the hydrocarbon molecule is hydrogen atoms. So, listed from lightest to heaviest, the components of natural gas are methane, ethane, propane, butanes, pentanes, hexanes, some heavier components, and liquid condensates. Methane is the lightest hydrocarbon gas and it often makes up the highest percentage of the natural gas. This gas, mixed with some ethane, is a typical gas which reaches a transmission line for sale. The value of a natural gas stream, in terms of dollars, is determined by two things. First, how much of each type of gas the stream contains. And second, the demand and availability of users for the individual components. Now, in some locations, this means selling the dehydrated gas containing many different components as a single product. For other markets, it means liquefying and separating the heavier gases from the methane, then selling the liquids as separate products. Now, always keep in mind, the more processing you do to a gas stream, the higher the operational costs are going to be. What we're looking for is the least expensive and most efficient way to process the gas stream. Now, Several different processes have been used to liquefy and separate heavier gases. The most common processes in the gas industry are lean oil absorption, refrigeration, and cryogenics. The appropriate process for a facility is determined by the makeup of the natural gas stream, available gas pressures, and the market for separate products. Lean oil absorption is one of the oldest separation processes that is still in use. In this process, when the lean oil comes in contact with the natural gas stream, it absorbs the heavier hydrocarbons. The oil, rich with trapped hydrocarbons, is stripped to recover the heavy hydrocarbons and prepare the oil for recycling. 
the heavier hydrocarbons are recovered by warming the oil mixture. Because of the high energy requirements, lean oil absorption is not very energy efficient, and therefore it's relatively expensive to operate. 90 to 95 percent of the propane and 98 to 100 percent of the heavier hydrocarbons can be separated and recovered with this method. Lean oil absorption, however, recovers little or none of the ethane. Another separation process that's been in use for many years is refrigeration. In the refrigeration process, the natural gas stream passes through a chiller. The chiller basically does the same thing that your home freezer does, only it uses slightly colder temperatures. The chiller cools the natural gas to a temperature range of zero degrees Fahrenheit to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit, using either propane or freon as a refrigerant. Chilling causes the heavier hydrocarbons to liquefy. Then they can be separated from the gas. Compressing the refrigerant and driving the condenser are the major energy requirements of refrigeration. Compared with lean oil absorption, refrigeration uses less equipment and energy to recover similar amounts of heavier hydrocarbons. Refrigeration separates about the same volume of propane and heavier hydrocarbons as lean oil absorption does. In addition, it can recover small amounts of ethane. Cryogenics is the newest and most energy efficient of the three processes. In the cryogenics process, the natural gas stream is cooled to extremely low temperatures in the range of minus 50 to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. Instead of using a refrigerant, Cryogenics uses a mechanical method to cool the gas which liquefies the ethane and heavier hydrocarbons. The liquids are then separated from the methane. Cryogenics does require additional compression to raise the pressure of the methane. However, when compared to lean oil absorption and refrigeration, cryogenics has moderate energy requirements. Cryogenics can separate and recover similar quantities of propane and heavier hydrocarbons as lean oil absorption. However, unlike other processes, which can recover only up to 25% of the ethane, cryogenics can recover much higher amounts, 80 to 95% of the ethane. To summarize, when you look at the energy requirements for the three processes and the amount of recovered hydrocarbons, in particular ethane, cryogenic stands out as the most energy efficient method for recovering more NGLs. Now let's take a minute to talk about gas chilling. Whenever gas is cooled sufficiently, liquids begin to form. You see a good example of this process when you fill a glass with ice and liquid. When warm moist air contacts the cold glass, it is chilled causing water vapor to condense on the outside of the glass. The temperature at which water vapor condenses out of the air is called dew point. Now the same process occurs when natural gas is chilled or when the dew point of natural gas is reached. Some of the heavier hydrocarbon gases condense and separate from the gases. If natural gas is chilled to a very low temperature, for example, minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit, much of the ethane, almost all of the propane, and the heavier gases will condense. The methane, being lighter, will remain as a gas. However, the chilling process will trap some of the methane in the liquid. NGLs with a high methane content are not marketable. Therefore, the trapped methane must be separated. Gas chilling operations maximize the amount of ethane, or heavier hydrocarbons liquefied but minimize the quantity of trapped methane. The quantity of methane which remains trapped during the chilling process depends on several factors. First, the pressure and temperature of the chilling system is very important. Less methane will be trapped at less pressures. Second, the rate at which chilling takes place is also a factor. More methane will be trapped if the temperature is reduced very quickly. Now the third factor is the mechanical efficiency of the vessel, which separates methane from the liquids. If the separation process of methane from liquids is too warm, not only is the methane released, but so are some of the heavier gases. Now there are three methods to chill natural gas. 
refrigeration, pressure reduction, and expansion. Each method operates in a specific temperature range. In refrigeration, an external refrigeration system using either propane or freon chills the gas stream. The temperature range for refrigeration is zero degrees to minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. In pressure reduction, a pressure reducing valve called a JT valve reduces the pressure of the gas stream. The reduction in pressure causes a reduction in temperature in the range of minus 50 degrees to minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. In expansion, the gas stream passes through an expander compressor. An expander compressor is a device which has two separate units, the expander and the compressor. These units are separate, but share a common shaft which transfers energy from the inlet gas in the expander to the compressor, where the gas stream returns to the expander compressor downstream in the process. Gas at a given temperature and pressure contains energy which is in the form of heat, pressure, or velocity. As gas flows into the expander side of the expander compressor, the pressure drops. The flowing gas turns a wheel in the expander. Energy to turn the wheel is removed from the expander inlet gas and is transferred to the gas being compressed in the compressor. The combination of gas expansion and removal of energy produces very low or cryogenic gas temperatures in the range of minus 100 degrees to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. As we talked about before, cryogenics involves very cold temperatures in the range of minus 100 to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. A gas leak or exposure to metal surfaces at these temperatures is extremely dangerous. You can be severely injured while working with cryogenic equipment. So please, when you're operating around units utilizing cryogenic temperatures, you must be careful. Cryogenic processing of a natural gas stream involves three basic steps. Dehydration, chilling, and fractionation. Dehydration is the removal of water from a substance. Because of the very cold temperatures in cryogenic processing, almost all the water vapor must be removed from the gas stream. Any water vapor remaining will form hydrates, which can damage equipment and even stop the flow of gas. Dehydration uses the processes of absorption and adsorption. The term absorption means the removal of water vapors from a gas stream by contact with a liquid desiccant. An example of a liquid desiccant would be glycol. Natural gas and glycol come in contact and the desiccant absorbs the water from the gas. Adsorption is the removal of water vapors from a gas stream by contact with a dry solid desiccant. A dry desiccant is a solid granulated material which has an attraction for water. An example of a dry desiccant would be silica gel. As gas flows through a bed of these granules, the water attracts itself to the surface of the granules. The granules absorb the water. A liquid desiccant can reduce the dew point of gas to as low as minus 30 degrees Fahrenheit. If the gas must be drier, dry desiccant dehydration is used. Dry desiccants can lower the dew point of gas to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. The method of dehydration used at a specific gas facility depends on the water content of the inlet gas. Now if water content of the inlet gas is high, first there will be liquid desiccant dehydration upstream, then dry desiccant dehydration will follow. After the gas is dehydrated, the second step of the cryogenic process is chilling of the gas. Now chilling is the heart of the cryogenic process. Dry gas is chilled in stages to liquefy the heavier hydrocarbon gases. The gas stream can be chilled by heat exchange with cold gas, refrigeration, pressure reduction, and pressure reduction with energy removal. 
The first three methods chill the gas stream to temperatures in the range of zero degrees Fahrenheit to minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. To obtain the lowest temperatures in the range of minus 100 degrees to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit, pressure reduction with energy removal is accomplished using the expander compressor. When the heavier gases condense out of the natural gas during chilling, methane is trapped in the liquids. Methane is boiled from the chilled liquid mixture in the third step of the cryogenic process, known as fractionation. Fractionation is a process involving heat that separates the liquids from the gas or any of the components from the chilled liquid mixture. Heat for this process comes from heat exchangers, which are part of the cryogenic process. The remaining liquid, which is a mixture of heavier hydrocarbons, is also a byproduct of fractionation. Well, that wraps up the first section. In it, we discuss natural gas components, economics of liquid separation, gas chilling, and the cryogenic process. All right, take some time now to read over this section in your student manual. Review the videotape if needed. Then, when you're ready, answer the questions at the end of this section. Now, in the next section, we'll look at a complete expander compressor cryogenic plant in detail. See you shortly. The expander compressor cryogenic plants, which use pressure reduction with energy removal for gas chilling. An expander compressor plant can be arranged in one of two ways, either pre-boost or post-boost designs. Pre-boost and post-boost plants contain similar equipment, However, the gas flow path is a major difference. In a pre-boost plant, the inlet gas stream is compressed by the compressor of the expander compressor. In a post-boost plant, the residue or processed gas stream is compressed by the compressor of the expander compressor. Because post-boost plants are the more common type, we'll concentrate on this type of cryogenic plant. Let's look at an overview of the process. The inlet filter separator removes free liquids in the inlet gas stream. Then a dry desiccant in a molecular sieve bed removes entrained water vapor. Depending on the water vapor content of the gas, the dehydration step may involve both liquid desiccant and dry desiccant in series. The dehydrated gas is chilled in stages by several heat exchangers and the expander side of the expander compressor. As the gas becomes colder, the heavier hydrocarbon gases condense and are separated in the cold separator. From the cold separator, the gas flows to the expander side of the expander compressor and the liquids flow to the demethanizer. In the demethanizer, liquids give up entrained methane. Liquids from the demethanizer are pumped to other parts of the operation for further processing or sales. The processed gas is recompressed in the compressor side of the expander compressor for further use or sale. Now let's examine each of the components in the cryogenic process in detail, starting with the inlet filter separator. Solids and free liquids are removed from the gas stream in this vessel. The suspended solids and liquid particles can include condensate, glycol, or lubricating oils, all of which can damage parts of the plant. These substances can be especially damaging to the molecular sieve beds. Inlet filter separators may be either vertical or horizontal. In a vertical filter separator, the inlet gas enters near the bottom. Liquids and large solids fall to the bottom. Gas flows upward through the risers into the coalescing elements. As gas flows outward through the elements, solids are trapped by inner pleated filters, and liquids coalesce as the gas passes the outer layer of the elements. The gas flows to the walls of the vessel and leaves through an outlet near the top. For a cryogenic plant to operate, almost all the water must be removed from the gas stream. If any water in the gas reaches the colder parts, such as the heat exchangers or the expander compressor, this water will form hydrates. Hydrates will plug lines or vessels and can damage equipment. 
a molecular sieve bed, sometimes called a mole sieve. Filled with a dry desiccant such as silica gel, can remove almost all the water vapor from natural gas. The molecular sieve bed is typically a vertical vessel containing a dry desiccant. Gas enters the top of the vessel and may be dispersed by a baffle. The gas then flows through a layer of ceramic balls. These balls, resting on a floating screen, further disperse the gas. The floating screen also holds in place a small adsorbent pellets of dry desiccant. Gas then passes through the adsorbent layer of pellets. These small pellets trap water molecules out of the gas stream. The hydrocarbon molecules are not affected and flow through this layer. Continuing the downward flow, the gas flows through another layer of ceramic balls. These balls at the bottom of the bed support the adsorbent pellets. Because normal wear of the sieve bed produces dust particles off the pellet surfaces, the ceramic balls reduce the flow of pellet dust out of the bed. The dried gas flows out of the bottom of the sieve bed. Cryogenic plants typically have two molecular sieve beds. One bed is in service, while the other bed is being regenerated. Now a sieve bed becomes water saturated after a period of operation. This time interval depends on water content of the gas stream and the capacity of the bed. When one bed is saturated, the gas stream is directed into the second bed and the first bed is regenerated. The saturated bed is regenerated by flowing hot, dry gas in the opposite direction of the normal flow. For example, bottom to top. After the first bed has been dried and cooled, it can be used again to dehydrate the gas stream while the second bed is being regenerated. Dust filters are vessels containing porous materials which allow passage of gas, but which trap or filter dust particles above a certain size. Now these filters, which can be vertical or horizontal vessels, are used at the gas outlet downstream of the molecular sieve beds. They trap molecular sieve dust and prevent plugging or damaging of heat exchangers. Heat exchangers are designed to transfer heat from a hot fluid to a cold fluid without mixing the two fluids. Depending on the makeup of the inlet gas stream, numerous heat exchangers, usually four or more, are used in various stages of a cryogenic plant. One exchanger chills the inlet gas stream. Two exchangers warm the liquids being processed by the demethanizer. And another heat exchanger warms the liquids produced by the demethanizer. A cryogenic plant can have three types of heat exchangers. Shell and tube, plate fin, and aerial coolers. Shell and tube exchangers are more commonly used with high process temperatures. For instance, on the incoming gas stream. When fluids are at cryogenic temperatures, for example, flowing from the top of the demethanizer, the plate fin exchanger is more commonly used. The plate fin exchanger is more compact and allows more efficient heat transfer than a shell and tube exchanger. While plate fin exchangers are more efficient, they can be easily damaged or plugged. To prevent this problem, a screen upstream of an exchanger cleans the gas stream. This screen is usually cone-shaped and held between two flanges. Aerial coolers are primarily used for residue gas cooling during or after compression. Chilled gas from the heat exchanger flows to the cold separator where the liquids condense out of the gas. The gas stream enters the vessel near the middle. This stream strikes a baffle, causing liquids to fall and gas to rise. The liquids from the bottom of the cold separator flow to the demethanizer. Gas rises through the mist pad and flows to the expander side of the expander compressor. Before we look at the expander compressor, let's review two principles of temperature and pressure. One, the temperature of a fluid decreases when the fluid is subjected to a sudden decrease in pressure. And two, 
fluid temperature can be reduced even more during the pressure decrease if some work is done, such as turning the blades of a turbine. This is the purpose of the expander compressor, to decrease the pressure of the inlet gas and to remove energy from the gas. Because the expander impeller and the compressor impeller share a common shaft, work is performed as the inlet stream rotates the shaft. This energy transfer achieves two things. It further chills the gas and it provides energy for compression of the downstream process gas. The expander side of the expander compressor works like a centrifugal compressor in reverse. High pressure gas entering the expander is directed at the outer edge of the impeller, causing the impeller to rotate. The gas, decreasing in pressure because of an increase in volume, flows toward the center of the impeller and exits at a lower pressure. As the gas stream flows through the expander, the gas temperature drops quite a bit. A typical drop would be from minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit to minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit. And as you can see, it does get cold. A portion of the gas stream condenses as it passes through the expander. Now this liquid does not damage the expander under normal operating conditions. However, if the gas stream contains particles of dirt or debris, water or carbon dioxide, serious damage to the expander may result. Now any of these solids can unbalance the impeller or erode the impeller and casing. Typically, a screen upstream of the expander removes solids from the gas stream. Now ice on the exterior of the expander is acceptable. The power developed by the expander drives a single impeller compressor on the opposite end of the shaft. This compressor is a typical centrifugal compressor. Low pressure gas enters at the impeller center, or I, and discharges from the outer edge of the impeller. The increase in gas pressure depends on the equipment. Typically, discharge pressures are 20 to 40 percent higher than the suction pressure. Gas expansion and compression uses impellers. An impeller, either open or closed, is mounted on each end of the common shaft. Expander gas flow is controlled by adjustable guide vanes located at the edge of the expander impeller where the gas enters the unit. A pressure controller, either upstream or downstream of the unit, signals an actuator which causes the adjustable vanes to open or close. This maintains the constant pressure at the impeller inlets. The expander compressor shaft rotates on axial type bearings. High pressure oil supplied to the bearings causes the shaft to rotate on an oil film, preventing metal to metal contact. Because of the different gas pressures in the expander and compressor, there is an imbalance of force along the shaft. This force is parallel to the shaft and is called thrust. Thrust forces in the expander compressor tend to move the common shaft toward one end or the other. Thrust bearings on the ends of the shaft help prevent this lateral movement. Impeller thrust in the compressor is regulated by a control valve in a line connecting the back side of the impeller to the inlet gas side. This control valve is usually preset to maintain a certain differential pressure between the front and back sides of the compressor impeller. Therefore, thrust bearing pressures are controlled. Expander compressor bearings are lubricated continuously with clean oil at controlled temperatures. Now bearing failure can result if proper lubrication is not supplied, even for a short period of time. In the lubrication system, lubricating oil is stored in a reservoir under pressure. This pressure may be equalized with the suction pressure of the compressor. The oil is moved by the pump from the reservoir through the cooler and filter. The cooler removes heat caused by the bearing friction. The filter removes solids. Oil then flows to the shaft bearings. Oil flowing from the bearings drops to the bottom of the housing. From here, it flows back to the reservoir for recirculation. In addition to moving the oil, 
The pump raises the pressure in the oil system. This pressure increase is necessary to force oil into the bearings. The extremely cold temperatures in the expander can affect bearing and lubrication performance. An insulating shield behind the expander impeller prevents the cold temperatures from reaching the bearings or lubrication system. A seal system composed of seals and seal gas restricts gas in the expander and in the compressor from leaking into the bearings and lubrication system. Labyrinth type seals are used on both ends of the shaft. These seals are a pattern of teeth machined on the impeller and seal rings. A small amount of gas leaks past each tooth of the seal. As the gas passes each tooth, pressure is reduced and the gas expands to fill the space. When the gas leaks into the space before the last tooth, it will be at its lowest pressure and largest volume. Seal gas also prevents gas from leaking into the expander bearings. This clean, dry gas is injected between two labyrinth seals in the expander. The seal gas is at a higher pressure than the outlet pressure of the expander and prevents process gas from leaking into the expander bearings. Some seal gas leaks and joins the expander process gas, while the remainder joins the lube oil. The lube oil and seal gas flow to the reservoir, where the seal gas separates from the lube oil and joins the compressor suction gas. Seal gas also prevents high pressure process gas from leaking into the compressor bearings. The high pressure seal gas is injected behind the impeller in an area with labyrinth seals on both sides. This prevents process gas from entering the bearings and lube oil. Seal gas then flows to the suction port of the compressor. The JT valve is a backup and excess flow device for the expander. Now whenever the expander becomes inoperative, the JT valve opens and creates a pressure decrease for the gas stream. Now the JT valve cannot reduce the temperature as much as the expander can. However, gas processing can continue. Now as an excess flow device, the JT valve opens whenever the flow of gas exceeds the capacity of the expander or when the inlet gas pressure increases above a set point. The demethanizer is a type of fractionating vessel where methane is separated from the chilled heavier hydrocarbons. Now as you saw before, the chilled liquid stream can contain large amounts of trapped methane. In this vessel, the methane is removed from the liquids while the heavier hydrocarbons remain as liquids. A demethanizer is a vertical vessel containing trays with bubble caps, sections of packing, or a combination of trays and packing. At each level where product leaves the vessel, there is a chimney tray. At the top of the vessel is an enclosed space with a mist pad. In the demethanizer, gas flows from bottom to top and liquids flow from top to bottom. Warm gas rises from the bottom through the falling chilled liquids. As the gas contacts the liquids, the lighter hydrocarbons, such as methane, are stripped out of the liquids. The falling liquids absorb the heavier hydrocarbons, such as ethane and propane, out of the gas. The product stream from the cold separator enters the demethanizer in the top half of the vessel. An immediate pressure drop causes some of the liquid to vaporize and flow upward. The remaining liquids disperse over the trays and the packed section. Then these liquids collect on the top chimney tray. From the chimney tray, the liquids, now a frothy mixture because of the rising gas, flow into the side reboiler. In this heat exchanger, the mixture is warmed by the inlet gas stream. The mixture returns to the demethanizer below the chimney tray. Gas from the warmed mixture rises through the chimney tray while the liquids fall into a spreader tray and flow into the next section. Liquids then pass through the packing and collect on the second chimney tray. This frothy mixture flows to the bottom reboiler, another heat exchanger. In this exchanger, the mixture is further warmed by the inlet gas stream. 
The mixture returns to the demethanizer below the second chimney tray. Gas rises through the chimney tray and the liquids fall to the bottom of the vessel. The liquids flow out of the demethanizer near the bottom. A level control valve determines when liquids are released from the vessel. These liquids, moved by a pump, flow through a heat exchanger where the liquids begin the chilling of the inlet gas stream. Gas flows upward into the top of the demethanizer. The chilled fluid from the expander also enters into this space. As the rising gas contacts the expander fluid mixture, the gas is further chilled. Any remaining heavier hydrocarbons are condensed out of the gas. Remaining entrained liquids in the gas collect on the mist pad. Gas leaves the demethanizer and flows through a gas-gas heat exchanger. The gas from the demethanizer cools part of the inlet stream and is compressed by the compressor of the expander compressor. Residue gas from the compressor of the expander compressor often is not at a high enough pressure to enter a sales pipeline. Now in these cases, the gas first may flow from the expander compressor to an aerial cooler. The gas is then boosted in pressure with an added compressor. Before entering the pipeline, the gas passes through another aerial cooler. Liquids from the cryogenic plant may be temporarily stored in a surge tank. An additional pump boosts pressure to move the liquids for sale or additional processing. As we've discussed in the first section, cryogenic temperatures are very cold. These low temperatures require that any vessels or piping involved in the gas chilling process be made of special metals. For this reason, where cryogenic temperatures are found, stainless steel is used for vessels and piping, and alloyed aluminum is used for heat exchangers. That wraps up the second section. In it, you saw the individual components that make up a cryogenic plant using an expander compressor. You also saw how the components work together and individually in the condensation and separation processes. All right, take some time now to read over this section in your student manual. Review the videotape if needed. Then when you're ready, answer the questions at the end of this section. Discussing an expander compressor cryogenics plant with post boost design. While the plant and inlet gas stream may be different from your facility, this example shows the changes in temperatures and pressures which occur during cryogenic processing. We'll take an example gas stream at a certain temperature and pressure through the cryogenic process. Now processing a natural gas stream with an expander compressor cryogenic plant requires a proper combination of pressures and temperatures. The makeup of the inlet gas stream and the markets for the residue gas and liquid products determines the exact pressures and temperatures for successful operation. So let's review the process flow of the gas stream and pay particular attention to the temperatures as the gas moves through the process. The example flow is a dehydrated gas stream with a temperature of 120 degrees Fahrenheit and a pressure of 1,000 PSIG. This stream will be processed to recover ethane and heavier hydrocarbons. Inlet gas enters the inlet filter separator where remaining liquids and solids are removed. From this vessel, gas flows to the molecular sieve bed. The molecular sieve bed lowers the dew point of the gas by removing almost all of the moisture. Typically, the gas leaves this vessel with a dew point of minus 150 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. To prevent dust carryover from the sieve bed, the gas flows through a dust filter. After the dust filter, the gas is split into two streams. Part of the gas, often the smaller stream, flows to the product heat exchanger. The other stream flows to the gas-gas exchanger. These two exchangers are the first step of the chilling process. In the product heat exchanger, liquids from the bottom of the demethanizer lower the temperature of the inlet gas to 91 degrees Fahrenheit. This inlet stream then flows through two other heat exchangers, the bottom reboiler and the side reboiler. In both of these exchangers, the inlet gas is further chilled, 
reaching minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit, while the demethanizer fluids are warmed to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. The portion of the inlet gas, which flows to the gas-gas exchanger, is chilled by the residue gas flowing from the top of the demethanizer. This exchanger lowers the inlet gas stream temperature to minus 51 degrees Fahrenheit. Both inlet streams, one at minus 38 degrees Fahrenheit and the other at minus 51 degrees Fahrenheit, are now mixtures of gas and fluids. These two streams join and flow into the cold separator. Condensed hydrocarbons fall to the bottom of the cold separator and the chilled gas rises to the top of the separator. Both the gas and liquids are at 975 PSIG and minus 47 degrees Fahrenheit when they leave the cold separator. Gas from the cold separator flows into the expander of the expander compressor. In the expander, the pressure drops from 975 PSIG to 255 PSIG, and temperature drops from minus 47 degrees to minus 138 degrees Fahrenheit. The stream from the expander is now a mixture of gas and liquid. This mixture enters the top portion of the demethanizer. A slight pressure drop causes the liquids to fall and the gas to rise. The rising gas is joined by gas separated in the lower levels of the demethanizer and chilled by the liquids from the cold separator. Residue gas leaves the demethanizer at 250 PSIG and minus 138 degrees Fahrenheit and flows to the gas gas exchanger. Here the residue gas is warmed to 110 degrees Fahrenheit by the inlet gas stream and experiences a small pressure drop. This dry residue gas flows into the compressor of the expander compressor. In the compressor, the gas pressure is raised to 309 PSIG, which also raises the gas temperature to 155 degrees Fahrenheit. When the gas leaves the compressor of the expander compressor, it does not have enough pressure to enter a pipeline. So the outlet gas first flows through an aerial cooler to reduce the temperature. Another compressor then boosts the gas pressure to 1,000 PSIG or higher. Because compression also raises the temperature, the gas passes through another aerial cooler to reduce the temperature. The gas then flows to further processing or into a pipeline. The processed liquid stream also goes through several temperature and pressure changes. The stream flowing into the cold separator is a mixture of gas and liquid. The liquids, ethane and heavier hydrocarbons, along with some entrained methane, settle to the bottom of the separator. This chilled liquid mixture at minus 47 degrees Fahrenheit flows to the top section of the demethanizer. Flowing downward in the demethanizer, across trays or through packed sections, the liquid mixture is warmed. As the liquid mixture warms, methane is released and rises. When the mixture reaches the first chimney tray, it flows to the side reboiler. In the side reboiler, the inlet gas stream warms the fluid mixture from minus 57 degrees Fahrenheit to 9 degrees Fahrenheit. The mixture returns to the demethanizer below the first chimney tray. The liquids continue to fall in the demethanizer, with the entrained methane being released and rising. At the second chimney tray, the mixture flows to the bottom reboiler. Here the temperature of the mixture increases from 30 degrees Fahrenheit to 58 degrees Fahrenheit. When the mixture returns to the demethanizer, the remaining methane rises and the liquids collect at the bottom of the demethanizer. These collected NGLs, also called liquid bottoms, flow out of the vessel near the bottom. The liquid bottoms are pumped to the product heat exchanger where they begin chilling the inlet gas stream. From this heat exchanger, the liquids flow to a surge tank or pipeline. There can be many variations in the design of a cryogenic plant. Now two variations which commonly are added during design are heat exchangers for chilling of the inlet gas stream and heat exchangers for additional warming of the liquid bottoms from the demethanizer. 
Chilling the inlet gas stream allows for higher recovery of the heavier hydrocarbons because of colder temperatures at all processing points. This additional chilling requires the use of a refrigeration unit to lower the temperature of the inlet gas stream. The refrigeration unit uses an external refrigerant, such as propane or freon, as a cooling fluid. Warming the demethanizer bottoms is done for ethane rejection, which means leaving ethane as a gas. In addition to the liquid bottoms flowing through the bottom reboiler, with this design they would also flow through another heat exchanger. This exchanger is called a trim reboiler. In this exchanger, the warming medium is from an external source. Often this source is discharge gas from a compressor. This concludes the third section. Now read over the last section in your student manual. Review the videotape if needed. Then when you're ready, answer the questions at the end of this section. During this program on cryogenic principles, you've seen some of the reasons for separation of natural gas liquids from a gas stream. We also discussed the most common methods for chilling a gas to separate the liquids. And finally, you saw how cryogenics can be used to effectively separate the components of a gas stream. A cryogenic plant uses condensation and separation to separate hydrocarbon liquids from natural gas. Now by understanding the principles of cryogenics and the equipment used in a cryogenic plant, you will understand how natural gas and liquids